Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I've always wanted to ask this. Can the last guy in the last row hear me? Please you raise your hand. What are you doing? <laughs> All right, good afternoon. It is good to see everybody here, so many of you here. And we're so glad that there are so many members attending online. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to attend today. This is very important to all of us. This is truly an, ex an exciting time, the beginning of something special. You are about to see and hear the details of a comprehensive renovation and improvement plan that will have the most dramatic, positive impact on all of us for the next 20 years. By the end of this town hall, all right, I didn't get that. I didn't get that. I'm only 16. Um, this suit is 16. I'm <laughs> sorry. So by the end of this town hall, you will understand why we say this plan is something for everyone and value for all. So before we get started, let me take care of some housekeeping issues. Because we have so many members attending online, and because we are recording this live, the rest, so the rest of the membership can watch the town hall later, if they like, over and over, please come up to the mic in the middle of the room, identify yourself, and then ask your question or make your comment. Questions and comments will be allowed from after each of the three sections of this town hall. First section being finance, the second being golf renovation, and the third will be facilities improvement. Some questions from members have already been received via the email over the last few days, and we will answer them first, and then we'll ask questions and comments from you in the audience here. As a courtesy, I'd like you, as a courtesy to your neighbors actually, I would like you to limit your time at the mic so your neighbors with questions and comments can also have a word. And one final housekeeping item, please silence your cell phones. Thank you. So how did we get here? As you probably can tell, we are very proud of this proposal and excited to bring it to you today. Obviously, we hope you support the proposal but there is one big question that needs to be answered, and that is, how did we get here? Please don't say, by car or I walked. <laughs> it has been a long journey to get us here today, going back as early as October 2016, and many of you deserve the credit and a big thank you for getting us here. If you are a member of the Strategic Planning Committee in 2016, under Giff Brown's term as president, please stand up right now. And remain standing. Thank you, Dan. And, if, and uh, if you are a member of the Strategic Planning Committee from that year on, 2016 on until right now, please stand up. Very good. If you were a board member during Giff's presidency, please stand up. If you were a board member during Dan Graziano's term, please stand up. During Bob Henry's term, please stand up. During Carol Benning's term, please stand up. And during Larry Trowell's term, please stand up. If you are presently a member of the Golf Renovation or the Facilities Improvement Subcommittee, please stand up. And if you were part of my campaign working group, who's worked very hard over the last two months, please stand up. And if you are a member of the Steely-Eyed Finance Committee, please put down your pencil and stand up. If you are a member 
And finally, if you are a member of the Stonebridge board that is presently serving us, all of us here at Stonebridge, please stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for all these people who have helped us design this program. You may sit down. Thank you very much. I want to thank them specifically for their commitment to this, to help Stonebridge become the kind of strong and vibrant community that we all want, actually that we all deserve. Now one of the most important and smartest decisions we've made here during this time is that we hired, a, 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 we hired what is called the member's representative. His job is to represent us, the members, during the entire process, and I call him our secret weapon. We knew we needed someone dedicated full-time to managing the project for us from the planning to the final move-in. Someone who could keep us out of trouble from designing something that would be too expensive or too impractical. He's already saved us several hundred thousand dollars during this time. Someone who knows the ins and outs of the county permit approval process so we can avoid red tape delays. And someone who has great contacts with suppliers and contractors so we can get the supplies and the labor we need when we need it. Such a man is Jeff Dunner, excuse me, Jeff Nunner. I can never say my D's or my N's together. His bio is on page 20 of the uh, voter manual you received earlier. His recent projects include Royal Ponciana Golf Club, Collier's Reserve Country Club, Quail West Country Club, the club at Sterling Oaks, and Ave Maria University. Jeff, would you just please stand up and wave? I call him the secret, uh, secret weapon on purpose because that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna keep us informed all the way along and help us decide and pay attention to what things could slow us down or make it more expensive. So from the very first day of my term as president, I pledged to provide every member with sufficient, accurate information about the amazing, comprehensive project you could make, excuse me, the comprehensive project, so you can make an informed decision when it's time to vote. In November of 2020, we created a new email newsletter called Bridging the Future, specifically to keep us up to date on the latest developments as they happened. The 26th edition of that newsletter was published just this past Monday, and I hope you've taken time to read those over and find out what's going on. You also should have recently received your copy of the Member Voter's Guide, providing a comprehensive explanatory explanation excuse me, of what is being proposed, the benefits you will enjoy, and how we plan to pay for it. Today you'll learn even more about the terrific project and then you will be asked to cast your vote. I hope you'll be as moved as all of us who have worked on this for so long are and that you will vote yes. Now let's begin the town hall. Uh, I would like to introduce Dave Harper, our treasurer. Unfortunately, Dave had a death in the family just recently, but he was able to record his report, which we will play now, and then we'll try to answer any questions that you have about that report. Dave Harper. I wish I could be there in person, but unfortunately, due to a death in our family, this is our next best option to being there. Usually, the cost and price tag come at the end, but this time, since you have already heard the numbers. The best place to start is with the numbers. So number one, we can clear up any misunderstanding or misinformation that is being spread around. And number two, get past the numbers to more exciting stuff. In other words, what we are all gonna get 
for this minimal increase of $12 per week. Let's revisit our financial related assumptions, goals, and guiding principles throughout the planning process and the commitment from this board. The cost of the facilities and the golf course renovations will not exceed $13 million. Funding for the renovation will come from two sources. $2 million from the Master Reserve Fund that is previously designated and available. These funds will be used to fund pre-loan and pre-construction costs such as owner's rep, architects, and consultants. $11 million will come from a new loan with a term not to exceed 12 years. The new loan would result in a new member loan assessment of not to exceed $124 per member per month. And I will say per member household per month beginning on or about March 1st, 2023, which will cover both principal and interest paid back over the 12 year term. There are no hidden or additional costs to you, the members. All renovation related costs are all included in the costs and the funding numbers. The potential impact on operating costs and capital reserves, we'll talk about it in a minute. But the payments, which have been $76 per member household per month, on the existing loan that was taken out back in 2012, I will continue to illustrate the affordable equivalent of that increase. So an increase from $76 to $124 per member per month is an additional $48 per member per month, or less than $12 a week. One member asks how much per day? It's $1.58 per day additional. That $12 weekly increase is less than two small glasses of wine per week at the bar. However, the enjoyment value of the new club amenities will be much greater and longer lasting than the wine. Also, just to put this in perspective, that $76 payment currently time value adjusted to 2023 using current construction inflation at 4.5% per year would be $130 per member per month. For those who continue to ask or challenge why the number is $124 when the average survey result was $110 per member per month from all respondents, not cherry picking numbers from the member survey but including all members that responded. The $110 was our goal. We did not view that as a mandate or as a not to exceed, which would serve to stifle the planning and the design process. Secondly, when checking the box, on what one would be willing to pay per month, no one had a clue what a wow renovation would cost at that time, let alone what the cost of construction would be in 2023. That leads me to my last point on this topic. The survey and the study were done in 2019. Therefore, if you fast forward four years to 2023, that $110 average at the current construction inflation factor of 4.5%, what do you think that number would be? Okay, I'll tell you. 
that number becomes $131 in 2023. We are holding this project at $124. And also, yes, the survey assumed a $10 or a 10-year loan. But again, no one had a clue what a wow renovation would cost, and we are significantly increasing the useful life of our golf course by extending extending its sustainability to 15 to 20 years instead of the normal 10 to 15 years. The existing loan will be paid off on or before February 1st of 2023, depending on the interest rate conditions. With renovations expected to begin around March or April of 2023, we tentatively plan to lock in the new loan rate to coincide with the start of construction. However, if the interest market begins to tick up earlier, we will want to grab the lower rates ahead of what the feds are likely to do. By the way, those numbers, 13 million, 124 per month and 12 years, are the same numbers that were proposed almost seven months ago at the last town hall meeting on April 19th. The difference now is the board is committed to not exceed those numbers. Let's now talk about contingencies and cushions that are built into the project. Questions have come up about this, so Let's discuss it because there are obviously three or there are obviously two major variables that could impact our plan. One is construction cost increases and the second is interest rate increases. So this is how we attempt to address those issues. There are three issues. One is there are 2023 inflation price factor contingencies built into the pricing. As you know, we are too early to get bids since we are still a year plus out at this point. Our owner's rep, with the backup opinions from local construction contractor, has built in cost inflation contingency into the base construction cost numbers for facilities to estimate costs out to 2023. On the golf course side, the estimates have some inflation price factors built in, but our architect Kip Schultes believes the cost estimates he has provided are reasonable estimates that can be achieved in 2023. He has been quite accurate in the past, so we trust in his estimates. Right now, he is bidding out his jobs for his April starts in 2022, so he and we will know soon how achievable those numbers are. The difference here on the golf course side is there's more labor and machine costs versus the normal construction material costs on the facility side. The second area of contingencies is general contingencies, which are included in the cost estimates. On advice from our owner's rep and the golf course architect, we also have general contingencies built into the project costs for the facilities and golf course, which come out to an average of about 7% on construction costs. The industry average is typically in the range of 5 to 10%, so we are well within that reasonable range. The third area is financing related cushion. Now these are not contingencies, but additionally if we can beat our budgeted estimated in 
interest rate of 4.5%, which I think we can, we could save possibly an additional three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars assuming we achieve a 3.75 to a four percent interest rate this will be what the finance committee will be monitoring and focusing on throughout the year to hopefully stay ahead of what the feds might do with interest rates this additional cushion equates to a range of three to five percent of construction costs. In summary, so with the inflation contingencies plus the general construction contingencies plus possible financing cushions, we believe we are in good position moving forward. This gives the Finance Committee some comfort given our recommendation to the board to hold this project to 13 million 124 per month and 12-year term. Obviously, as you know, things can change rapidly over the next year, but no one has a crystal ball. We will adjust and deal with the changes as we encounter them. We also looked at the operations impacts of this plan. We looked at the potential impact on operating costs and capital reserves in three views. Number one, the impact during construction. Number two, the post-construction operating impacts. And number three, the impact on capital reserve assessments. These three pieces do not require a board or member vote now, since they are estimated budget impacts for operating budgets not yet in play so they will be addressed as part of their respective annual budget process. However, these analysis are important to present to you, the membership, so that you are fully informed when you cast your vote. These are currently included in your voter package, but let me summarize them. Again, during the construction or renovation project, Managing the variable costs related to the temporary loss of revenues while continuing operations with certain fixed costs, we estimate or approximate $174 per member household during that renovation period of nine months in 2023 and 2024. The second part of the operations analysis was after the renovation is completed. We looked at what the financial impact on revenues and expenses might be post-renovation. Obviously, we add more seating capacity and maintain the bistro year-round. When we do that, it will add more cost to operate. We pay a little more to enjoy such improvements, just as most everyone here has done over your lifetime when buying a bigger home. You expect your operating expenses to increase. Just to remind you, this is not a new phenomenon. This same impact occurred when we opened the current clubhouse back in, 2020, or, uh, back in 2013. This potentially could add approximately $92 per household per year, or $7.70 per month. The third area is uh, future capital requirements. We looked at what those financial impact on capital reserves and master reserve assessments might be. Post-renovation, using input from our independent reserve consultants, we take out reserves required for assets replaced. So obviously, the assets that we tear down or replace are no longer going to be reserved for. And we add in the reserve requirements for renovated and new assets. And the net impact of that is minimal. The potential annual increase in future capital reserve 
requirements, mostly benefiting from the improved golf course sustainability, is approximately $6.58 per member household per year or 55 cents per member household per month. So the total of both the post renovation and the reserve requirements is $8.25 per member per month, potentially more. These calculations reflect how management staffs and operates the existing bistro they fully expect there will be efficiencies and productivity with an improved kitchen design and the facility layout to be gained once the new bistro is functional. So they believe these numbers will be improved upon. Okay. The last area I want to cover is I want to revisit why we are doing both projects simultaneously and doing them as soon as possible. And these have been covered before, but let me go through them quickly. We reduce the inflation risk because construction is increasing at an average rate of 3.7 to 4.5% over the past nine years. We avoid the impact of two borrowings and increased interest rates. The, first of all, the club would be prohibited from entering into two separate loans until the first loan is paid off. But most importantly, with any delay, the likely result will be much higher interest rates than we will be able to achieve in 2022. Third, it avoids multiple disruptions, which is very important. Number four is the codependency of both projects and the creating of valuable usable land. An additional 10,000 square feet of usable land makes the bistro and the needed community center a possibility. Not to mention the added usable square footage from the newly renovated golf course. And lastly, increased sustainability. And you've heard that term over and over, but it can't be stressed enough. The renovation of the golf course significantly improves sustainability for a longer useful lives, which in turn reduces future capital assessments out of the master reserve, which nearly offsets the cost of the new and renovated assets. So this is where I will end my part of the presentation and turn it over to Jim and we can open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you to Dave. He, is, he has been a godsend through this entire thing. He's the, one of the smartest people I've met. And uh, he also has a sense of humor, which is good. Uh, we asked... Uh, a few days ago to send in email questions, and uh, we're going to break this up by finance first, golf second, and then the uh, facilities third. So let me just read some of what we got from the emails from this section. A few questions came regarding the reserves, which Dave just was referring to. So I thought I would try to be helpful um, and give a brief explanation about how the reserves come into play. Uh, a reserve fund is kind of like a savings account allowing organizations to acquire and or replace certain assets, such as a commercial oven, for example, in a, in a professional kitchen. Each asset acquired or replaced has a useful life. The capital reserve funds for assets purchased and then gets replenished or reserved over time based on the useful life of these assets using what they call a 30-year pooled reserve study reviewed by outside consultants and updated annually. So using the oven ex example, if we purchased a new oven, 
we have already set aside for reserve or reserved money for the purchase of that oven before we buy it. It may have, in fact, a useful life of, say, 20 years, so we spread out the funding for its replacement over the next 20 years. This is not a replenishment, as some have suggested. It is a savings for the future purchase of the new oven. Another set of questions that came in. Um, if the plans that we have need to be changed in the future, for whatever reason, how will decisions be made regarding what we should be changing? As you know, and as David repeated several times, the board has pledged not to exceed $13 million for the cost of the project, not to exceed the cost of each member's household of $124 per month, and not to exceed a loan term of 12 years. So from the minute this proposal passes, hopefully, there will be monthly monitoring of everything, cost of labor, cost of materials and supplies, interest rates, etc. We will do this so we can quickly anticipate any change that might negatively affect the, our ability to complete the project on time and on budget. The sooner we see the need for a change, the sooner we can make any adjustments to lessen their impact. The decision process for making changes will depend on the, imp will depend on the impact such a change will have on our plans. For example, if the change is relatively small and won't hamper our goal of staying on time and on budget, management will make that decision and notify the board. If the suggested change would not put us over budget but would severely impact the goals of the plan, that decision will be reviewed by the appropriate committees and discussed by the board. If the change would put us over budget or substantially delay the completion of the project, that decision will be made by the board and may include a return to the membership for your suggested remedies. No matter the size or scope of any potential change, ongoing progress reports will be made to the membership. Uh, another questions, a uh, series of questions that came in. A number of questions came in regarding what might happen during the construction. And again, David talked a little bit about the money there. But first and foremost, you should realize that the grill room and the dining room will remain open during construction. And the food and beverage staff will be there to serve us. The maintenance staff will be assigned to work with the contractor, giving us the double benefit of keeping them employed by and loyal to us and saving the project a substantial amount of expense. And as we did during the COVID slowdown, we will do our best to provide other work for staff. There are many things that may have been put on hold or regularly scheduled projects that could be accomplished by our existing staff instead of paying for outside workers. Another question that surfaced uh, is happening, what is, what it will happen if the vote passes or fails? What do we do afterwards? We will hold a special post-election board meeting to analyze the outcome if it passes, we have a laundry list of things to do and will convert the mission of our golf renovation and facilities improvement subcommittees from planning and design to implementation. If the vote fails, we will meet to discuss what happens, excuse me, what happened and what steps, if any, should be taken. Now those are the questions that we received from the emails. And I open it up to the floor for anyone who has a question about the financing. Please, again, identify yourself and let us know. Uh, let me have your name. And we are Larry, excuse me. We are Larry and Joyce Linder. We are 25-year owners. 
Uh, oh, I got to put my glasses on, sorry. <laughs> this is our only home and we love this community. We're not here to challenge the financials. We're here to challenge the process. Your vote this month will be a litmus test for our future. The litmus no vote is a single factor that will change our course. This vote is at the very heart and soul of Stonebridge. Let me explain. The Save Our Stonebridge group owners agree it is not a member driven project and that we have been treated unfairly. It is driven by consultants, contractors, architect, realtors, fitness gurus, surveyors, general manager, owners rep, strategic planning committee, and how many unknown dollars already spent. The SOS group has sent out detailed rationale, but la been labeled as naysayers. You will hear more from them today. We are interested owners and your neighbors, not board adversaries. We oppose the one vote decision on two very complex projects. Let me give you some background. In 2016, the board changed the Stonebridge nominating procedures, which results in a network of board leaders selecting followers who sing the same tune. The nominating committee has controlled the future of the past last five boards, 14 out of 15 nominees approved had served on the strategic planning committee. We are not anti strategic planning, just the one vote process. Our board members are all professional people and have done a good job for us, but they sing the same tune. No surprise that this board is unanimously for this project. Our SOS group asked for only one thing, two votes, not one vote. If we can't have two votes, it needs to be a no vote. If they had granted us two votes, we would not even be here now. If this yes vote is, if this vote is yes, any future dissent of the board will be zero, nil. Why? Because the incumbency and power of the board denying our legitimate concerns has been unfair. This board is not listening to owners and knows what's best for us. The board denied 93 owners in May the two vote request. If these two complex projects are so great, what are they afraid of? A yes on both plans would have made it a member driven plan. Larry, let me introduce, let me interfere please for a minute. We have addressed the two vote issue. We voted for it in September at the board meeting. And I would ask you to control your interest towards the finance part of this project. Well, that, I said I'm not here to, uh, to challenge the finance. Some other people will be challenging that. I, I, let me give you, let me explain how we've been treated unfairly. And Larry, your comment, your, your comment to try to turn me off is not fair. Larry, let me, please, let me explain. Please. Well, let me explain. We have a lot of people in this room that have a lot of concerns one way or the other. I've tried to ask you to control what you want to talk about to financing. This is a presentation that was made on financing. You can talk about that. When we get finished with the golf, you could talk about the golf. You could then can talk about the facilities afterwards. The two vote versus one vote has already been decided by the board. Could I respond? You certainly can. I, I asked Tim Jones when I could speak. I would like to speak. He, I said, I, it's not a financial question I have, but it's a process question and a process concern that I have. He said, okay, let me explain how we've been treated unfairly. This is only a few more minutes. Okay, do you want to hear this or not? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand here. You're going to have to call the sheriff. <laughs> Let me explain how we've been treated unfairly. As all right, all right, all right. Let's let now. They, Larry, here, we're supposed to be neighbors. Larry, is this how you treat a neighbor? Larry, two is minutes. This, is this our values that the that the uh, Stonebridge, uh, uh, the, the, the strategic planning committee came up with? And it's very good, by the way. A values to communicate, promote transparency through clear and honest and open communication. Is this how you're going to treat me? 
We've been here for 25 years. Don't we get seven minutes? That's how long this takes. Larry, two minutes, please. Two minutes. Two minutes, please. We asked the Communications Committee to use Thursday's voice. They, de they denied us. We asked to present our case on community voices. They denied us. The pro-yes Hawthorne owners given access to bridging the future was denied to us. We asked to use the Stonebridge email list. They denied us. Is it too much to ask for free speech and transparency on both sides of issues? This is your community. It is stated in our value statement right here. Now, the, the member's voting guide, which, which I have right here, was very professionally done, was mailed to all owners. We can't afford to mail, we can't afford to mail calendars, but the member's voting guide was not a money problem. Oh. Read the many promises in this guide and page 17 caveats carefully. How you and any future owner dissent can compete with these denials and dollars spent by our board. How can we do that? Page 18 of the Motors Vog has vote and ballot information. When you vote, demand secrecy. Ten years ago, many of you were not here when the community rejected the first clubhouse renovation. But the second vote resulted in a great winner. How will, board, how will the board handle the voting results from vote now? Fair to both sides? Will the board know the individual results? We want secrecy. We asked vote now for secrecy, but have no answer yet. Doubt we will get one from them or the board. The litmus test is this, folks. If you vote no, you send a message to this board and future boards that owner dissent must be treated fairly and that your vote counts. Thank you. With unknown costs Larry, and unintended consequences in these inflationary times, <laughs> in these inflationary times, vote. Is this, is, is this is what you mean by when you do the values? Larry, your two minutes is up. Thank you very much. We know your position and we Now the rest it. of you know how, if you ever have a dissent, this is how you're going to be treated. Thank you. Any, any other questions regarding the finance? Bill. Yes, yes, sir, please. To the, we have people being recorded for live because of that, so come on over. You have to arm wrestle Bill. Good afternoon, friends. I, I, I've been here for 27 odd years and love you all. You're great people. This is Bill Whitman, for those uh, who have not Let me give heard. you a chance. I, I'd like to give you an update on the finance. Uh, currently, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, index on construction uh, materials has gone up 40% in the last 12 months. The construction on labor has gone up 10% in the last 12 months. Uh, the project manager, which is terrific that we hired that, and I think it's great, he projects a 4.5 uh, construction materials increase. So the point I'm trying to make is you may want to readjust your, your baseline number. Thank you very much for your time. Bye. Thank, thank you, Bill. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Gary Wilson. Um, if I heard correctly, and I just a point of clarification, I thought I heard Dave say that the loan payments would begin in March of 23. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And construction would begin when? Uh, it would begin, it might even begin a little bit before that because of uh, the ability to do things behind the scenes that won't affect your pleasure here at the, at the club. Okay, the, the point I guess I'm trying to get to is you're going to have to take down an $11 million loan Yes, sir. In order to begin payments in March of 23, when the construction project has probably not even begun. Your Do point? I understand that? Yes. I, I don't know your point. My point is you're going to take down an $11 million loan before the project is finished. That is. And? And, and you're going to do what with the money? Well, you draw, you know, as a, as a recovering banker, I should tell you this. Uh, when we make a loan to somebody to build a house, we give them the whole loan, but we do watch what they do, and we do we give the money out in draws, is what they call it. So the money is owed, 
but it's not spent until those particular parts of the construction are done. So this is nothing unusual. Well, in a construction loan, you take it down in draws. You're going to take down an $11 million loan You're mixing and the begin same making term. payments in March of 23. Is what I heard. That's I'm, not a construction loan. You're you, going to take the whole thing down. You've lost me. We are obligated to pay that loan back. We will start to pay that loan back in March of 23. Whether it leaves the bank and goes to the contractors or not is immaterial. The minute the loan is as you call it, taken down, once the borrowing is agreed to, you obligated to pay for it. It doesn't matter when the construction starts. Okay, so you're going to have $11 million in a savings account somewhere. Oh, my God. Now you're just being a dead horse. You just clearly don't understand the process. It's up to the bank. You know, it's, the bank is now obligated. Actually, the bank is getting an asset. We are obligated to the bank to pay that loan back according to the, the, the documents that we have. I don't understand the process, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was a commercial banker for 40 years. I was the head of credit risk management of one of the largest banks in the country. I think I understand the process. Okay, thank you. My name's John Burnham. We've been here for 23 years, but regretfully I was also a banker. Not, not for all of those years, but close to it. As a matter of fact, I headed a small bank mortgage department. So I'm very familiar with draws. One of my primary jobs was loaning money for building homes. There's some confusion, as you've already denoted by some of the members saying, you know, the bank's gonna make a commitment for $11 million, payable out over a period of time of construction whether it's a monthly draw, whether it's a quarterly draw, whatever the arrangements are, are made. My problem is, as an ex-banker, with regard to the fine print that the board has established about nothing will be done well, until such time as that existing loan is paid off. We have the money in the bank to do that. So if the board elects to do that, it's my understanding they can do so. So that if this proposal is accepted, they could withdraw the money from wherever it is, investments or whatever, pay off the existing loan. So no longer is the year 23 the magic number. Is that a fair statement? Uh, not really, John. First of all, uh, I attended a meeting here in this room that was pretty fiery, and the message came back from the members, we do not want to have two loans out at the same time, period. Number two, it's my understanding that the documents that we have, that we operate under, do not allow us to have consecutive loans at the same time. We're not talking about two loans. If we take the reserve money and pay off the existing loan, we no longer have a loan. Therefore, we can legally enter into another transaction at an earlier date, which has been alluded to. That is possible, yeah. yeah so, so, so suddenly now it is possible where it wasn't possible earlier. So that if this is approved, the steps to get started could go earlier. Are you suggesting that we start earlier, John? I'm not suggesting it. I'm warning the people that it could start earlier. So that's all I'm saying is that there's that fine print in there that says you can pay it off early also removes the board from the obligation of not doing anything until 2023. The other factor is relative to the financing is that if it is not paid off, now, but they continue to pay, make the monthly payments till February of 23. As soon as that loan is paid off, we don't stop paying. We basically increase the monthly setback, let's call it, or the, the loan balance. We mm -hmm. start paying on that money then without any benefit of it. 
other than accumulating principal one way or the other. Is that a statement too? Pretty close. So for nine months, we're going to be paying $124 a month. That's going to go into some account of some kind with the facility pretty well shut down. Is that a statement? Uh, not really, but uh, you're making the point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Any other uh, finance questions? Okay, very good. All right, now it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, oh, we have, sorry. I just have a question. Sure. Jim Godey, I, I'm a new member. Uh, I borrowed a lot of money over the years. And a lot of it is on a draw basis. You don't start paying interest until you take that money out. So and in answer to the last gentleman's uh, question, if we paid the money off on the existing loan and we locked in a loan for the new construction before the feds start raising the rates, which are Paul's suggesting within the next five months, would we save more money doing that than we would by the process you're taking now? Well, that will be analyzed between now and after the vote is passed so that we can make that decision. And then we would probably come back and say, all right, this is what we'd like to do. But at this point in time, knowing what we know, we're going to pay off the loan till it's finished, and we're going to start the new loan right thereafter. But thank you for the question. Anybody else? Finance? Okay. All right, now it's my... Uh, Pleasure to introduce Tom Pinkerton, who is the chair of the Golf and Greens and also the chair of the subcommittee on golf renovation. And just a word about Tom. Um, if, uh, one, of the, one of his ways of operating is that when he gets a question, he actually calls you up, tries to have a sit down and talk things over. And it's been very effective. He's answered a lot of questions over the last nine or 10 months, I don't know. But Tom, Tom Pinkerton. Well, thank you. We now begin the fun part of the meeting here today. Um, our architect, who I was just sitting with, said, I get to follow that, okay? <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm sure that happens when you have a great comedian or a terrible act in front of you, but whatever. We are um, glad to be here today, and we're going to talk about the golf course. Um, Tim, if that next slide. Um, no, was there a list of... Uh, committee members. I just wanted to thank these people. The, the people on the Golf Course Renovation Committee have done a, a wonderful job. Um, we have met many times and talked many, many times and talked to many of you, so we appreciate them. We also appreciate the input from many of you. Uh, we got a lot of input about uh, the golf course. Uh, it's been out there for several years now, so um, that makes sense. But today, um, we are going to have uh, Kip Schulteis, who is our architect, take us through the plan. Um, Kip is a recognized leader in the course renovation and redesign business. Um, I hope you go home and look at his website. You will be very impressed. Kip has done a long list of successful projects. Uh, we would be familiar with places like Vanderbilt, uh, Copperleaf, and Bonita. Um, for those of you who have played in the Stonebridge Cup, he did Stonebridge in Boca. Countryside is a job he's done recently. Our committee had a great call with the people in Countryside, the team that kind of led their renovation, and they could not have been more complimentary of the job that Kip did and the professionalism with which he did it. He is currently working on Palmyra up in Bonita, and so we are fortunate to have Kip working on our golf course. So with that, Kip is going to come up and go through the plan. Thank you, Tom. Um, you know, he mentioned all the projects that you say you're fortunate to have me. I appreciate the opportunity because you actually hired me before I did all those projects that Tom named because we did their match plans so many years ago. <laughs> um, my name is Kip Schulteis. I am a golf course architect based in uh, Jupiter, Florida. Uh, we, as Tom mentioned, we have got ourselves into the renovation, restoration, redesign business and been doing it, uh, I would like to say, quite successfully for about, about the last 20 years, primarily all here in South Florida. 
I mean, realistically, we only focus on about seven or eight counties in the South Florida market doing anywhere from three to six projects any summer that range from anywhere from two to $12 million each. So it's a quite active market down here, as you all know, your neighbors from time to time go into renovation and we probably, as Tom said, done some of those projects that you're familiar with. Um, this process at Stonebridge here actually started way back in I think late 2016 and 17 when I got a phone call about potentially doing a master plan. That is coincidentally just after we finished the Stonebridge in Boca that Tom referenced a few minutes ago. Um, we always start our, our master plans with what we call focus group sessions. And the reason why I do that, I'm going to take a step backwards here, is that early in my career, we would get phone calls from clubs about wanting to do a golf course renovation. And so we would go in and meet with the Greens Committee. And as you can probably imagine, a lot of Greens Committees are made up of maybe five or six members. Primarily, they are good playing men. Okay? All right? And so we would put over three and four months, we put a great plan together that satisfied all those guys in the Greens Committee. And we'd go out to do a membership presentation just like this. And I'd be all excited about what we've got up on the screen. And you could see some of the ladies and older gentlemen saying, did you design it for them? Do you think about us at all? So long story short, we were having a success rate on membership votes like you're about ready to undertake of about two out of every three being a positive vote. Well, when you're only doing two projects a year, 10 and 15 years ago, that hurt my pocketbook when one of them didn't pass. So we said, let's take a step backwards and let's get try to get members involved. Now, it's not feasible for me to go talk to, let's say, six, seven, 800, 900 members all at Stonebridge, okay? But we started all of our focus group sessions, I'm sorry, all of our master planning, what we call focus group sessions, where I said, I went to the committee, I said, give me 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 high handicap men, 10 to 15 high handicap women, 10 to 15 low handicap men, and 10 to 15 low handicap women, and we met with them all separately. And we would put every hole, for instance, we did this at Stonebridge here, we put every hole up on a screen. I don't know how many of you participated in those things. It's been four or five years now. But we put every hole up on a screen. And we said, you know, we know at some point in time it's going to be time to rehabilitate your assets and rebuild your greens and rebuild your tees and rebuild your bunkers and fix some drainage problems and maybe fix some playability problems. But your golf course at Stonebridge is not my blank canvas to go play with. It's your golf course, okay? I'm only here to fix the things that ill you. So I'm asking you to tell me what ills you. And, you know, we put, like I said, we put every hole up on a screen. I said, tell me what you like and what you don't like about each hole. And the comments just start coming. All right, you guys are very open with your comments about what you like and particularly about what you don't like. And so we documented all of those comments from four different sessions, meeting separately. And I will tell you why we do it in four different sessions. I always use the ladies as a, an example on this one. You know, the, the better playing ladies, those of you in the audience who have, let's say, a... 15 or 20 handicap or less who play from a little more of the forward tees, if you will. I say, I would say a little further back than some of the other ladies don't like to give in to the higher handicap ladies. They don't want anything to change because they love the competitive advantage they have. Whereas if I break the, like, the nine holers apart on the ladies that might hit it less, they said, oh, this hole, you know, when it's a par four and it takes them six to get there. I said, would you like me to build a tee a little more forward? Oh, Absolutely. Well, you know, if I ask the, high, the low handicap ladies, they don't want any part of that. The high handicap ladies want this. So that's why we meet with groups separately. you got 118 holes, and this one golf course has to fit all facets of the membership. And so we take all those comments from all those different, from those focus group sessions, we take that to the drawing board, and we come up with a conceptual plan that addresses as many of those comments as we possibly can. Now, certainly there's comments in left and right field that you can't address, but ideally we get about 70 or 5 or 80 percent of those comments addressed in a plan, we go back to the Greens Committee, we present it, we then tweak it and get it prepared, you know, prepared for membership presentation to put numbers to it. And that's how this project came about. As I like to say, you the members designed the golf course that you're ready to take a look at and you've been looking at. It's not me coming up with crazy ideas, it's what you all asked for. Okay, it's where you told me you had problems and here's how we fixed it. So in that regard, before we go hole by hole, which we're going to do just in a second, I kind of want to highlight some of the things that were focal points on coming up with this plan. Number one, you all recognize you have a relatively tight, small golf course. You can't be very errant when you miss the fairway left or right. Sometimes the same thing around the greens. We know that you're constrained by preserves, conservation easements, streets, property boundaries, things like that. So what we did is we got a map of your conservation easements, your preserves, because obviously we can see the streets and the property boundaries, and said, how do we optimize 
the land that you have to play on for, as Tim says, sustainability and playability. Okay, we looked at all those boundaries and said, let's look for every nook and cranny of space that Stonebridge has to offer because it's my understanding you all only have about 65 to 70 acres of maintained turf. Just so you know, the average 18-hole golf course around here has close to 100. Okay, so you can't be very errant here without losing some golf balls here or there. So we want to go find every nook and cranny of space and say, how do we optimize every inch that we have out here? Okay, from a playability standpoint. And that's how we started this thing. So we looked at it from spatial constraints. You know, one of the things we talked about was the playability of certain holes. In some cases, we looked at, I know in talking, while we don't build all of your golf course as looking at it from the number one or number two tees, there was problems with four or five holes about carry distances off those tees. We can't use the one tees on four or five holes uh, like 15, like 16, because of the carry distance. Can we please solve those issues? And so we came up with ideas how to, to better those relationships and better, better some of those carry distances. We looked at the playability and the narrowness of some holes. I use number seven as an example. You know how narrow that throat is going into the green, okay? How do we can maybe open that up? Well, obviously, I can't move the homes on the right, so we look at adjusting the water on the left. Fair enough? Now, rules of thumb here in South Florida is whenever we go into a project, we first contact an engineer and say, do you have any excess surface water acreage? Why is that important? Because all of the rain that falls on Stonebridge must be self-contained in Stonebridge before it flows out of the property. That's the way all of Florida is designed to retain water runoff in rain events. Okay? You can fill in lakes so long as you recreate surface water of lake. That is what, how drainage works here in South Florida. So, for instance, if we want to fill in some of the lake on number seven to make a, more, a, a larger approach here and a larger area to be errant, if you will, I then have to dig out a new lake somewhere else. And so we are looking at opportunities to fill in holes, fill, fill in lakes on holes 3, 7, 10, 16, and 18, and most primarily, this other project that someone's going to talk to you about in a minute, how do we give you bigger space around your clubhouse? We fill in lake. I have to recreate that. That is part of our, what we call our lake modification plan to help satisfy your, your clubhouse expansion area that's going to happen here. We have to recreate that surface water out on the golf course somewhere. So we've already got that in our calculations to help the other project be get approved. Okay, through our golf course modifications. Drainage was a concern of Mark Metzger, particularly holes like 1, 6, 9, 14, and 16. Things a little bit wet, things a little bit damp, you've got some organic soils there that need to be removed, so we'll address those kind of things. Um, course length. I was asked to make a comment about course length because if you look carefully at some of the drawings, you see some things have been adjusted. Sometimes greens are pulled back away from trees or sometimes back tees have been moved forward a little bit. In a general sense, the golf course is going to be the same length for just about every tee. There is a possibility that the number one tees will become just a little bit less, dealing with some of those forced carries that I talked about on some of those holes like 15 and 16, making sure that you can get use out of those tees going forward for more, a larger percentage of your members. Given the fact that your golf course is not very long anyway, I think it's what, 63, 6400 yards from the tips, we don't want to take away from any other tees you use, but try to make those ones and two tees a little more playable for a little more use, okay? Um, we talked about the movement of water. You know, Stone Bridge, always at, I, the first thing when I came to Stone Bridge, I said, where's the Stone Bridge? <laughs> they said, we don't have one, but we'd sure like to have one. We sure like, like to have one. So there is a Stone Bridge being planned on hole 17 and 18 where there's going to be a water crossing coming across. I will show you there one of your signature points. Um, there's been discussions about berms. Are we manipulating berms? In fact, I got phone calls last week about, are you touching the berms on this hole? Are you going to touch the berms on that hole? You know, part of trying to open up the golf course, if you really look at your footprint, your berms on some of the outside do take up a lot of space when they're very large. While we don't need to modify many of them, there are a few. I will use the first half of number three, a little bit of number four. I will say the T's on number 12, if you can use your imagination real quick, are going to move to the left side and up on the berm there, so we need to modify that a little bit. And then, of course, over on number 15, we're going to be modifying that berm a little bit and, and picking up all that property that goes out to the property line way out to the left. Okay? As far as we are to date, no other berms will be impacted this time. Okay? So that hope, I have gotten numerous phone calls about berms and how, do we, how they're going to be manipulated. So without going into any further detail, let me start going through the hole by hole here real quick. Um, and hole number one. Now, the thing on hole number one, it's one of the more narrow holes. If you can look at the picture on the left, the picture on the left, as you see on the screen, is the existing corridor. All right, the hole number on the right is the, is the new corridor. You can see how we're trying to open up. Now, 
the area left of hole number one is deemed a preserve. We can't touch it. The area to the right of hole number one is not a preserve. We can remove some trees, transplant some trees, and open up space that way to take the landing area more to the right and open up so that Mark has, a more, has more sun exposure, more airflow, things like that, to give you a better turf surface on both the landing area and in and around the green complex. The green itself, you can see in the picture on the left, is almost in the shade on the edge of the green. Greens don't like to be shaded. They're real, real sensitive to shade, so we take the green also and we move it slightly right when we rebuild it. Okay, so it's in full sun and better airflow all day long. So agronomically, you'll have a better result there. Um, so you've got a bunker on the left of the green. All I'm doing there is expanding that existing bunker to keep you from going into worse place. Rather, I'd rather you land in the bunker than go into the preserve on the left and lose a golf ball. Okay? So bigger, wider landing area, bigger green. Lastly, there'll be a little bit of a, 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 I'll call it some elevation behind the green. So if you miss the green a little bit long, hit, a, hit a, what we call kind of a hot shot in the green where it's going through the green, there's something now on the backside to help contain it and slow that shot down from going down into the trees on the backside. All right? Hole two. Fairly significant change here, although you can't really tell. The biggest change you're seeing on this drawing is a lake behind the green. Okay, and I know it's, it's for a couple members, I think it's been a little controversial. I'm not sure exactly why. But we have taken the green and we've slid it back into the approach a little bit. Now, there's actually a new tee going back further to, so that we maintain the course length. All right? We are also taking that bunker that right now, when you come into the front of that green, that bunker is covering easily 75, 80% of the front of that green. You have to come in this itty bitty little sliver on the front right to get to the green complex. We're going to take that bunker and move it way off to the left-hand side where you see the cart path because the cart path is no longer going to go behind the green and come back around the other side. We're going to keep it on the right-hand side of the green so that it stays out of play. All right? To open up the hole a little bit, you know, there's there, to the right of the fairway, there's kind of a, a low area, and then you find the fence line that separates you from, I believe that's the dog park or whatever that is over there. We're actually going to take your, expand that fill all the way to the property line over there because literally on the other side, you've got some trees and things like that, and we will put a new hedgerow in trying to buy space going right. Going left, the area between the homes and the fairway, while it looks like a low area and you would think it's a preserve, it is not. The preserve stops before you get to the homes there, so we're not going to take all the vegetation away. We're going to take about half of it out and expand the fairway by a good 15 or 20 feet left as well, trying to optimize or maximize the fairway area. Okay, give me the biggest fairway you can possibly give you in that small space. Okay, the cart path, one of the, one of the key reasons why we're trying to get the cart path, and this is a continuous cart path going down the right-hand side, is I remember coming out here a couple of your spring times in February and March after you've had a heavy wear period, you, that cart path right now where it used to take you right down the middle of the beginning of the fairway and it was all worn down to dirt because all the cart traffic. We want to make sure your cart traffic stays out to the right and off your fairway so your fairway is in a nice, playable, thick grass condition. Okay, so we're trying to get the cart traffic off the fairway. There's nothing more detrimental to grass in South Florida than cart traffic. And it's been even worse thinking about it in the last year and a half when COVID is, you know, promoted, being promoted as single cart riders, so you've got double the amount of carts. It's just aggravating all that cart traffic and the matted down effect. So that's the biggest change on two. Of course, the, the hole stays the same. The bunker in the front goes left. The bunker that's on the end of the landing area actually pushes back right a little bit. We introduce some water behind the green, which actually is a, a, improves a drainage condition. Where right now, everything slopes down towards the house, so that solves that for those homeowners. Hole three, one of the bigger changes on the golf course. All right, the back tee slides away from the homes a little bit to allow the water to come through to connect. This is the first place out of about three or four where the berm is going to be slightly modified. We're going to reduce the berm down just on the first part of the hole where the adjacent property is the dog park, not the baseball fields. Okay, so we're going to bring that down a little bit. At the same time, what are we going to do with all that dirt? We're actually going to take it left and it, throw it into the lake a little bit on the fairway side to enlarge the fairway area. All right, so you've got a much bigger fairway area, and we're also then going to take the cart path and extend it down past the landing area so that you don't have that, again, where that cart path ends right now and it empties you right out and where it tends to wear those spots out. You'll now disperse in different areas for sustainability of your fairway, if you will. Okay? Once we go further down, then we saw an opportunity to really do something nice. Okay? Uh, this is similar to a couple of holes that we've done at uh, some of the real high-profile clubs in the East Coast where we're going to take the green, the cart path, as you see it right now, if you hit that cart path, it only exacerbates the ball going in the lake left of the green. So we're going to put the cart path on the right-hand side so it's not a detriment to golf balls going in the water. We're then going to take the green, we're going to fill a little lake and move it left, put a stone wall on that, on that green, make it a real risk-reward coming into that green complex, and then take 
all that, all that material that we dig out on the left-hand side, you can see we brought the lake down the left-hand side of the uh, fairway. So there's four or five homes now that get new lakefront. Okay? All that dirt we dig out of that lake goes and builds up number four tees a good 10 to 12 feet up. Something that's kind of different for Stonebridge and different model clubs here. We get a really elevated tee. If you go back to the back tees on four, you know they sit in a bowl right now. The back few tees, we're going to fill it up to the top of the bowl. So there's a really high plateau back there working itself down off those real high. So it's a real vista tee, if you will. It's just we have to get rid of the dirt anyway. Okay? Just a good use of space and a very, very dramatic look. But everything we keep right of the second landing in the green, all that berm stays up so that it still tends to screen out the ballpark on the other side. And I will keep in mind, when you're looking at, if you're, those of you that are concerned about maybe opening up a view to the dog park a little bit, there would be a new hedgerow put along the fence line, but keep in mind there's also a lot of pine trees in the dog park. The, you know, a lot of the trees that are buffering the, the baseball fields are actually on the dog park property. Okay, it's not like we're removing a lot. We're going to take some things down, probably no different than what you saw in Irma, and then replant it. We're going to do the same thing and modify some things then, then re-vegetate it. Okay? Hold it, moving on to hole four. Well, okay. There, didn't know that slide was in there. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> this is a little example. I'm going to go back real quick. You see how that green's bent out to the left with the, out on the water's edge? This is how that will look, although this is from Adios Golf Club over in Coconut Creek. Your fairway area going into the approach here at Stonebridge will be significantly wider than that. But it's a, it's a similar look with a big high background, and that's the tees in the background that would be where the, all that landscaping is for number four. Very, very pretty aesthetic look, something we think will be one, become one of your signature holes if you allow us to do so. Okay? Moving on to four. Again, very, very high tees stepping down towards the water's edge. We are going to fill out into the lake just left of the landing area, again, to buy you some fairway width there. The green itself is basically in the same location, but instead of it being sideways, we put it on about a 45-degree angle so there's better accessibility to it. The bunker on the left, there's no bunker on the left of this one. We put a bunker on the left of this one to keep you all from driving the shortcut. <laughs> you know how you all take the shortcut left in front of the green? Mark is like, I'm fed up with all the cart traffic, all the wear and tear, so I said, I'll put a bunker in there. So now you do have to go around the green the way it's designed to be. All right, so that's why you see a bunker on the left of the green. But the green, again, is at a slightly different access, which is more accessible to the incoming approach shot. Hole five, other than trying to bigger, make the tees slightly bigger in the back two tees and then enlarging the forward tees so it's now big enough for two sets of tees itself. We expand the lake across over to the right hand side because you have what we call somewhat of a dead space over there. And I, as I said earlier before we started going through the hole by hole uh, comments, you know, we have to create additional surface water acre for those areas that we fill in. All right. I used seven as an example, we'll get to a second. So this is purely just adding surface water acres for drainage to offset places we're going to fill lakes in other locations. Five itself is realistically, you can see it's the same green complex, almost the same approach. Uh, it's just a slightly different modification of a T in the lake. Okay? Hole six, T shot looks the same other than the back couple T's have moved left. You know, right now they are up against the homes. Why did we move them left? For the same reason, once I move those tees left and put them out in the lake a little bit, I can now expand surface water acreage going up the right-hand side in what we call an unused space. It's per my calculations. The landing area is pretty much the same with the two bunkers on the left. The green is basically in the same place. It's moved back just a little bit, but we didn't take the bunker. There's a bunker that's short right of the green by about 20 yards. It, it, we call it a green side bunker, but it's really not. It's just this bunker sitting right at the approach. So we, we take that bunker and we move it up relative to the green so you don't have those 30 and 40 yard green side bunker shots, okay? The rest of the hole stays the same. Now there's been comments, many questions about the berms that exist between holes six and seven. If you look carefully, there's berms right of six, there's berms right of seven, it's not the same berm, there's two hills. There's a hill, a valley, another hill, and then you go down into each other's fairway. For the, for the betterment of space and making more, more spatial relationships and making it fit better, to make more landing area space on both holes, we're combining the two ridges of berms into one. So if you're standing here from a distance looking either way, it will still look like the same mass still exists there. It just will be half its width. Then we can put trees and things on top if you want, but we're buying more real estate for the landing area on six and on seven in the process. Okay, so that's I want to answer that question for you. Going on to seven, the biggest change we're making on seven, besides, like I said, the landing area is wider because we took the two berms and combined them into one between six and seven. So there's now more room to be errant outright of seven. 
All right, because there's so much room out there, I decided to squeeze you back in with a couple bunkers. I got to have you remember me somehow. All right, now going into the approach, obviously one of the narrowest parts of the golf course here. Uh, there was a lot of complaints in the focus group sessions about how narrow that approach area was. So we're literally almost going to double the width of the approach area by filling in the lake, putting in a rock wall around that feature and tying it over to number eight. The rock, reason why we put the rock walls, besides the fact that it's aesthetically pleasing, it also serves to take away lost area because of slope. You think we build, we build have to, we're required by Collier County to build lo lakes on a four to one slope. So if you think about a top of bank being four feet above what we call controlled water elevation going on down, by putting a vertical wall up, we buy ourselves somewhere between 15 and 20 feet of usable space. So that's why we do it, particularly on very, very tight golf courses. All right, hole number eight. Uh, we enlarge the tees as best we can. We actually create a new middle tee, uh, a new forward tee, a little further by filling some of the lake in. The biggest complaint on eight was the location of the weir structure. You know, the big thing that sits on the left of the approach so we will be moving that for you. Um, applause. Okay. Now, th those of you who like to hit the top of it and bounce onto the green, sorry, that's not going to happen anymore. Um, the way you do that is you actually just simply take a pipe, and you're going to extend it over through the approach over to the right-hand side over in the rough somewhere or into the woods a little bit, and then you'll have your structure sitting over there where it's realistically not in play unless you shank one right, and I can't help that one. Okay. The green itself is the same green, although we are going to elevate the back side of it so you give us a little more backside containment. So if you hit it long left, you've got something to contain your shot instead of going down into the trees that are back there. All right. Hole number nine, other than fixing some of Mark's drainage problems, no change to nine. It is literally the exact same hole. Everybody's seen the like number nine, thus we moved on to number ten. Again, we're, if you told me there was no issues, we just skipped it. I mean, nobody complained about nine, so there's no changes. So we go on to ten. Ten, a little bit like seven, you got some few narrow spots out there. Uh, the tees m move away from the cart path, and we fill in a little lake by the tees just to get your tees wide enough to make them easier for Mark to maintain. At the landing area, we fill in a little bit of lake to the right of the short of the approach, I'm sorry, short of the true landing area, just so those of you who don't carry the, dis the ball very far have a, a comfortable place to hit a drive if you're not going to reach the true landing area. Same thing on the green. If you can look up there, you can see that little cove of water comes in by the green. We're going to open that back up a little, fill it in a little bit, put a new, take out the wood bulkhead wall, put a rock wall in there. The green itself will have a much seemingly lesser contour in it. Right now it's got some pretty good slope in it. We'll mellow that thing, mellow that thing out, give some containment on the back side so it's much more receptive to incoming shots. Yeah. 11, same thing. Bigger tees, you, it's hard to tell there. We're actually filling in a little bit of lake by the tees to make bigger tee complexes because on par threes, particularly short ones, you take a lot of divots and you need to move, you have space to move those tees around. The green itself is actually moved to the right. We compromise the water there as well a little bit. We put a rock wall on that. By moving the green right by about 15 to 20 feet or so, and elongating instead of making it fat, we can now bring the cart path in and around the back side of the cart path for better accessibility so it's not, you're not wearing all these spots. That was a desire of Mark and some of the staff to better the distribution patterns to and from the cart path. Uh, the old cart path will actually remain in place as a maintenance access path. Okay, so technically if you want to park on the left side, you can still go around the old way and come back around. We're just trying to make sure there's better accessibility to the green there will be room there. There is not room now. By the time we move the green to the right a little bit, you will have more than adequate room to bring the cart path inside the hedges and then take it back out for, for better serviceability of the green. Okay. 12. Uh, this was actually, a, 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 I call it a last second change that happened literally about a month and a half ago. Uh, it was finally decided, we talked about it four years ago, about do we flip the lake and put the lake closer to the condos? Because you know you, the, the tees are very, very skinny there. The cart path is literally right up against everybody's lanai who lives on the first floor. So you've you got all these people parking there and talking right if you're right. So we decided, how about we move the lake over to lanai and put all the tees over on the other side. You've got a berm up there so we can elevate them and take the cart path on the left-hand side. So now from an aesthetic standpoint, you've got a very nice view looking out the condos. Now, if those of you who are worried about, hey, why are we doing that because that sounds expensive, dirt is not expensive to move in South Florida. You're talking about $2.50 a square foot, and that lake might be eight or 9,000 cubic yards. So you're talking about a $25,000 cost to make a change that I think would be desirable by a lot of you. Okay, so it's, it's a very, very small amount of money to make this change, just so you know. Cart path then stays down the left-hand side in that berm, uh, continues on down. The landing gear stays the same, although we did put one bunker left just to make sure you stay right because there is some a pretty good hillside coming down. The biggest change you'll see is that the cart path that crosses the approach is gone. 
Okay, so it's no longer in play anymore. So again, it's kind of like eight. If you like the idea that you land on the cart path and got a kick, it's not going to happen anymore. Okay, but ideally you don't have cart paths that cross fairways aesthetically. So we're keeping all your cart path on the left-hand side. The only reason why there's a cart path there is so Mark or whoever's servicing the pump station can drive a vehicle back there. But what we will do is there's a swale kind of, we'll have a swale kind of behind the green between that and the condominiums that is just a grass swale. It has some firmness to it. So if you the one time a year you got to drive a truck back there, if at all, it's just driving on back there. It won't be an issue. Okay. Then behind the green, we can put some you know, aesthetic landscaping, things like that, to make it look really pretty. Thirteen. <clears throat> we are adding a, a back T or two uh, to the left of number 12 green just to add some length and some angles to that hole. This hole looks a little bit different. Uh, it's got some drainage problems that we're going to fix out there. Um, you know, we, we didn't design the bunker strategy on a bad day. I was very, very sane when I did that. It does look a little busy up there. It's just trying to give a slightly different look and some, a little bit challenge. We did pull the green back into the approach a little bit just so we stay out of the shade of all the trees behind that green complex. We built up the backdrop so it's got some backside containment as well. Again, so if you hit a long shot, you're not going off and down into the sable palms. Okay? 14. Realistically, there's zero change in this hole. We, we once suggested moving the cart path left of the green, and we were told just to put it back. So other than fixing some drainage ills that are happening between the cart path and the condos, there's no changes hold. I will tell you the only thing we're proposing, you know that very, very back number one tee that's about the size of a postage stamp and in the shade all day long? We're, we're suggesting you not try to keep that and just get rid of it because it's just, it's, Mark's having a heck of a time trying to grow grass in the shade all day long. If you all don't like that, I can certainly just leave it there. Okay, so we can all talk about this to prove the project, whether you want to keep a T like that. All right, other than that, no change. 15, one of the more problematic holes, uh, we had originally proposed maybe pulling some of the fairway back. Uh, it was it got a little pushback from some of the condo owners tr trying to reduce the carry distance here. We did take the back T and we've moved it a little bit more left to help reduce that carry distance a little bit. So this is a hole that we may have lost 10 or 15 yards on. Obviously, we've made it up on a couple other holes, but just trying to make sure that carry distance is feasible so that more of you can use the one and two tees, okay? The tees on the left of the lake, uh, they get a little bit bigger by just encroaching down the lake slightly. The biggest change you're going to see here is a lake up on the right-hand side. Now, if, you, if you're out there on hole 15 and you think about it, go look left because about three or four years ago, Mark cleared the area left of the approach into the green you know there's a lot of room over there. There's a lot of room that exists all the way down the hole, so we're going to actually take some of that vegetation out, some of that berm out there, and we're going to go recreate it over by the property line then revegetate it. By doing that, it allows me to create this lake on 15. The lake is not there to be problematic, although it's aesthetically it is something to deal with and, and to play around, but the surface water calcs allow me to make some of the fills on some of those other holes to solve those issues. Okay, like, like we're going to deal with on 17 and behind the clubhouse. This lake is key to getting your clubhouse area done. You know, that is about a 10,000 square foot lake, which is about the same amount you're trying to fill in back here. That calculation means we have a, by doing this, it means we have a permittable plan through South Florida Water Management. Okay, so that's why that's there. The cart path of the green, we're going to take it up, the, now that we've got all that room on the left, we're going to take it out left and bring it back around. For the few of you that might be here that live in that condo to the back right of the green, all the trees that exist there now are going to be there. We're not touching any of them, okay? If there's, the cart path will come back around there. If there's anything that you can see there, we will plant something on the, on the low side of the cart path there so that those of you, particularly on the first floor, would never see a thing on the cart path, okay? We're not trying to take away your view. We're not trying to take away anything better. I, I would probably guess that maybe a few of you on the second floor would like us to take the tree out so you can actually see the green, but that, I'm not going to take the tree down unless you all tell me, okay? All that vegetation will remain just as it is today. 16. Biggest change here is we have filled in a little bit of that lake, uh, that little pinch point where it's just short of landing on the left, so that none of you hit your ball, if you, any of you pulls it left, you can now be safe and on dry ground anymore. So the fairway area and the landing area, just short of the primary landing, and just got a little bit wider. Okay. Why you all like the big tree in the middle of the approach, I don't know, <laughs> but I was told to leave it there, so it's still there. Okay. Like it, we leave it. Like I said, if you like, it's not my blank canvas to play with. You tell me you like something, I leave it there. Okay, so it's still there. Uh, we do try to buy a little real estate by 
again, putting a, a, a hard shoreline or rock wall on the lake bank all the way back through the approach past that tree so that you're, you've got more room to play with and get around the tree. All right? The green is literally in the same place, okay? but what you see differently is going up around 17 greens. So let, me, so let me flip to 17 real quick. The bridges are due to be replaced because they're old. They're getting a little old, rickety wood bridges. Um, the the we have a problem. Mark has a bit of a problem growing grass where the existing 17th green is. If you know, you go back in there. It's wooded. It's got a fan back there. Airflow is terrible. He can't. He's having a hard time back there. So what we propose doing is pulling that green towards the lake more, actually filling in a little bit of lake to get that out on the edge of the existing body of water and out in full sunlight and full airflow. Okay, well, I didn't want to give you a 120-yard hole. Okay, so what did we do? Nobody really looks at this little uh, area down here by the T. I mean, there's not really any condoms that look into that too much, so we're actually going to fill that in. Okay, and move your T's all the way back to the street. When we do, we'll elevate all that and make it a really pretty landscaping feature on the downside of that, that as you come in the other entrance off of, what is that, uh, airport pulling? Is that airport pulling? When you come out of that entrance, it'll be a really pretty landscape feature that happens right behind that T complex. Okay, so that's how we're manipulating that hole and then still maintaining a golf hole that is from the back tees at least 160 or 170. So it's maintaining its length by just sliding the tees back and then putting the green out on the water's edge. This has some of the same characteristics of hole number three with a nice high backdrop, some framing, we'll do some landscaping behind the green complex. Now you're seeing back there behind the green, what it, it looks like lake, it is. Because where I had the green before has now become dead space. We're not going to use it and you know I need surface water to offset fills we now put a pond back in there, which nobody's ever going to, you shouldn't be in that one, okay? If you really missed that one, you, I, I can't say never, it's golf, but you never shouldn't be in that one. That is way, if you missed that one, there's, a, there's a lessons in the pro shop for you. All right, finally, 18. Here's your sample of the, this is a sample bridge that we did at Adios Golf Club. Uh, this is where, let me go back real quick, because this is where we're talking about the, the cart path, once it services the forward tees and you're driving over to the green on 17, there's a, you see that body of water crossing. You see the, on the left-hand picture, the lake on the left, the lake on the right, which is by 18 tees. We're going to connect those two. That's where the bridge goes. Now, everybody's asked me, you know, can't we do a bridge somewhere else? I'm like, this is the only place realistically where this works. All right? So there's your stone bridge location. This is a sample stone bridge of what we did at IO. So we could look something like that, making a feature of the golf course. Okay? This is, a, this is all built in concrete block, rebar, and everything else, and then they put all this, the, the real stone on the outside of it. So it is, a, it is a feature there that will easily last 100 years. You know, the pipe that's inside of it is a 6-inch galvanized aluminum that has a 100-year warranty made by Contec. So it's, it's there for a lifetime, so it will outlive all of us. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a feature of your golf course. It's something you take pictures of. It's something you'll talk about. So that was always kind of a desire by even in the folk troop sessions is like, give us a stone bridge. So here's where, here's where it fits. All right. And then finally on 18, uh, the tees are relative in the same place. Obviously, the water crosses through the stone bridge, through the tees, and over to the lake on the right. We do fill in a little bit of the lake on the right at the very forward tees, again, for those players that are the back tees, so there's not that long carry distance, so there's a little wider fairway going into the, before it opens up. The rest of the hole pretty much stays the same, although we do, it was a desire by the club to, because of the view from the clubhouse, to add the rock wall all the way down the lake bank as you come into the clubhouse, okay, just for aesthetic reasons. The green itself is very much in the same place. Um, the, we put a bunker left of the approach, not because we're, mad at you, but just to keep you from going into the preserve on the left, try to steer you away from that. So um, other than that, really no change to 18. So well, I think the last slide we've got here, and no, we're not doing a driving range with no targets. I promise you there'll be target greens out there. We just didn't show them. Uh, th the biggest change here is in a three-dimensional aspect. We're going to actually squish your range to you a little bit. We're going to squish it down. The reason why we're going to squish it down, if you go out there and look at it, you look at the street elevation, it's all built up like five and six and seven feet above the street. Well, on a, on a three and four to one slope, you're losing usable space on the top because you keep building it up. The top gets smaller and smaller the more you keep going up the side. So we're going to squish it down about two to three feet so that we can maximize its width and its depth. At the same time, we are then going to enlarge that cart path area behind. Right now, it's a little bit of a traffic jam, particularly in, in season, where now you'll have what we call two -way tra comfortable two-way traffic, which is 14 feet wide, and you'll have parking stalls of 10 feet on each side. So if you want to pull in and service the putting green or, pu or service the driving range tee, there's plenty of ways to back up, turn back around, move around without getting all the congestion that you see now. All right? 
by lowering, all, by lowering the putting green. Not, I'm not taking it down to street level. By lowering it, say, within a foot or foot and a half of street level, it all of a sudden gets bigger because it's now wider. Okay, so you're going to have a bigger putting green with more usable space just because we squished it. Now, I'm not trying to take all the elevation away from you. I'm just trying to make it so that you optimize your usable space so you can sustain these things as big, you know, as big as they possibly can to use all of the space that you have. All right. One of the ways we can also enlarge it right is there's ability to actually take the first tees, move them a little bit right. There's a couple trees we remove or transplant, move that right, that we can move the range tee right as well. By doing that, we are optimistic that we'll be able to slightly enlarge your short game area. It's a very tight space. We're going to go find every nook and cranny that we can to try to better that condition. I wish I could take out a bunch of trees and preserve, but I can't. So we're going to try to do everything we possibly can to give you a better short game area, but I am very limited on space. I can assure you it will be, at the very, very least, slightly better than it is today and hopefully significantly better. So with that, I believe I'm turning it back over to somebody smarter than I to talk about other things. So, oh, you, oh, you want me to take this? What's it? You got this? I'm going to say, let me, let me say, make one more comment on schedule. Uh, if you approve this project, uh, the construction would start on or around the last day of March, early April, April 10th, April 15th, somewhere in that vicinity, depending on where your events fall, where your holidays fall, things like that. Um, generally speaking, this project should take about four and a half months to do construction. So you'd be done around the end of August or Labor Day. Uh, at the latest, maybe, maybe as early as, 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 as August 15th, if that works out, you'll be back open sometime in November. I can't tell you if it's going to be November 1st or November 21st, but somewhere in that vicinity you'll reopen depending on fall weather. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to somebody else. Well, thank you, Kip. That, that was a great presentation. And uh, I, I guess we do want to open it up for a couple of questions. If anybody has anything, we've got Kip here and, and Mark is with us. This is the time to ask people who know the answers. Sweet. No, right? no yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Go ahead, Terry. Hi, I'm Terry Berry. My wife and I have been residents here for 22 years. I realized, because I talked to you earlier, that these pictures that we're looking at are subject to change. Uh, and I just wanted to go on record as saying I've, I've lived through where we had uh, cart paths on every hole. I've lived through where they tore cart paths out because we didn't like them. Mm -hmm. And now you've got them on almost every hole again from tea to green. And I think that's a, I think it's a, uh, it's a waste of money because I'm not sure many people are going to use them. Uh, so I'd like to save money if we can by reducing the cart paths. Yep. Terry's actually asked me four or five questions before this meeting actually started. So we, you know, he, he's right. Look, look if, if, if he asked me specifically, why are we have continuous cart paths on seven? And I said, you know, we did this match plan four and a half years ago. I don't recall why we do. Okay, so if, if, if a, con for instance, if a cart path is a controversial issue and it's shown on the plan and most of you say we don't want it, you don't get it. I won't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'll do whatever you all want. So if that's an issue, we just modify the plan and take it out. So uh, forgive me if that's a minor detail. I, you asked me how did that come about, and I don't recall four and a half years ago we did this plan. So that I don't recall. I remember just about everything else. I didn't have the answer for you then. I don't have the answer for you now. But again, if you all say that, hey, we don't want cart paths in certain locations, you won't get cart paths. You know, there are certain holes I will use, like number two, where we did show it going all the way down the right-hand side because you know how bad number two fairway has become. We're trying to keep you off the fairway. You know, it may, might, might make sense there. But again, that's your call. If you, if you want the matted down fairways and you want the car traffic, I got no problem with it. It's, it's your call. I'll, I'll, do, I'll defer to the, the masses on that. So. I don't remember. <laughs> so, so. Yes, sir. Hi, hi. <clears throat> Hank White, we had spoken before about some of this, particularly hole five. Yes. Which is outside my backyard. Yep. And we're, we have now no water. Hmm? Everything is water. Hmm? And uh, based on my experience, professional experience as a maritime lawyer, hmm? water seeks its own level. So the sure query does. goes, we, how can we prevent any undermining of my property uh, 
with a pool and a cage back there. And you know, I asked you, uh, basically, are there any options? And the comment was made to me, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, you know, whatever the committee wants, which I find a little disturbing, because when I go to the committee, it's, well, you know, uh, basically we have an architect and we're working mm. with him. Mm. So catch 22, who's on first, who's on second? Who's making the decision here uh, about this? And, and, and again, I don't mean to challenge your expertise because I've looked at some of the other golf courses and really well done. And last one is that in going forward, maybe uh, because you made the comment about how the rock walls give us additional flexibility, that we do more rock walls, which would actually look better, and but at the same time give us the flexibility. So thank you for your work with us. No worries, thank you, sir. Um, relative to the rock walls, I'd love to do more. It's just, you know, we, we are obviously sensitive to your budget allowances, and rock walls are not cheap. They look great, but they're not inexpensive. So, you know, I think you were talking about maybe doing more of them, is that right? Right. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I have no problem with doing more of them. It's just, it's, a, it's an expensive line item. But again, sustainability, you know. Um, no, no, no argument. A wood, a wood to a point. Only, <laughs> good, yeah. No, wood is only good for, you know, 25 years. What, what, what's that What's that $124 a month? If you want to make that $150, we will get it done for you. I mean, I, you know, I'm just, it's, you said sustainability, and I'm like, okay, I, I can put rock walls out there all day long. It's just money. Right. You and, know, uh, we're trying to be sensitive to your budget at the same right. time. But at the same time, sensitivity to the people who live here and uh, what can be done. Are there any alternatives? to stay within the budget, and uh, par apparently it is not. Um, you know, wood, wood is actually a little cheaper. Yeah, no, wood, wood walls are a cheaper, little cheaper, but they, don't la but they don't last more than about right, 20 years. 20, 20, 25 years right. is the useful life. Right. So uh, and even with creosote covering. Right. So just the query is, is there, are there any, uh, basically, um, is there any flexibility in this, any alternative? Well, I mean, like at Palmera, we have a combination of we have a combination of some slopes are sods, some slopes are rock walls, some slopes are riprap. There's an alternative rock that we're covering. Some slopes are native plantings, that very similar to copper leaf that I did. If you go to copper leaf, you know all their lake banks are native plantings. They got no grass on them. Now, if you miss the fairway, the rough, and you go on the lake bank, you've got a lost ball, but it looks good. You know, you may not like the playability, but it looks good. Um, you know, those those are realistically your options because you've got to put something on there that's going to hold something otherwise it's going to wash out. Let me go back to your, your first comment. Uh, yes, you did call me about uh, alternatives to expanding a lake into what we call a, a what, we are, what I call a dead space to the right of number five. Uh, yes, we do need surface water acreage to satisfy some of the playability problems that you have, satisfy some of the desires around the clubhouse that you have to fill in lakes. That was a place where we could do that. Um, I did go back and look at an alternative to that. And there is one, it, but it, it brings the cart path right behind your house and not the lake. So if you bring the cart path all along the homes back there, and the lake then stays a good 20, 25 feet away from your property line, we can do that. Well, actually right now with the uh, gold tees, people come by our house, and so it really doesn't make any If it doesn't matter to you, I can actually make that change. Yeah. I mean, I don't know your neighbors are going to like it, but I can certainly do that. Well, <laughs> if you look at the diagram, there are no neighbors that have, have this issue. It's just my problem. No, the, the lake we've got drawn impacts about five homes back there. I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, there, like I said, there's Thank an alternative, but you're welcome to discuss it. Thank yeah. you. Uh, sir, yes, sir. You know, if we could suggest an alternative, it would be helpful. Uh, I, ju I just did, sir. I mean, that, that is, that is the you. alternative actually discussed with the club. Thank you. Thanks, sir. One quick question, if I may. Uh, yes, what are the total cuts and fills on this course as we re redesign it? Oh, now you're testing my memory on the. Uh, I wish I had that in front of me. I'm gonna. I, I I don't have that off the top of my head. It's it's in our it's in our uh, our bid estimate. And, and I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say seventy five, eighty five thousand cubic yards, something like that. Okay. And then uh, per cubic yard, moving dirt is how much? Give or take, depending on which contract and how they place profit and, and management fees and things like that, but a round number is about $2.50 a square uh, cubic yard these days okay. in this area. I think you said cubic foot, and I went, 
Cuba you're, sound, you're sounding like Cuba New England when Sorry. you say that. Oh, thank you day. very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Nice, yep. uh, nice presentation, beautiful drawings. I just wondered, in all your meetings, has anyone taken it in consideration or thought about the chipping area that, uh, that we have now and what we could do to enhance that? Yeah, I kind of I kind of hit on that at the end of the presentation that we are obviously going to try to make that as big as we possibly can. Uh, you know, you you are stuck between a street, a driving range, which you don't want to hit by driving range balls. So I can't move the range. Yep. Uh, the the only opportunity you've got is there there may be a couple more trees down there that are not in the conservation easement that you could possibly remove. If yep. they're not in the easement, I promise you, you know, I'm not I'm not a tree killer. I love oak trees. I love sable palm. I mean, I love them, but. You know, you, you, if you're asking for these things, we try to find every nook and cranny we can. And we'll thank take those trees down and, and use that space as best we can. Okay, thank you. I mean, you. I promise you, we'll max that out as best we can. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Clive Ozard. I probably should have asked this question at the Finance Committee. But I would like to know of the $13 million budget, how much is being spent on the golf course and how much on facilities improvement? I can answer. I mean, the golf course budget right now is five point eight million. Oh, I assume you can do the math on the rest of it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So. <laughs> Kevin O'Flaherty, uh, Kip. Part of my question was already asked, but uh, this is our third renovation. We've done two previous ones, mm -hmm. and n neither was as extensive as this mm -hmm. from construction and engineering. And both of those took about seven or eight months. Number one, are you confident that this can be done in seven or eight months? Mm -hmm. And number two, with the cubic yardage you're going to be taking out, I was told you're, you're going down several inches on each fairway. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to bring new dirt in. Mm -hmm. To me, that's hundreds. No, you're not bringing new dirt in, by the way. You're, just, you're generating it on site. You're not bringing anything new in. Nothing comes from off site. So what, what are you doing to our dirt that you're going to dig it up and do what to it? You, you just you, you you take the you take the top layer, which is which is grass mat and organic material that's built up. Like, think about this: when you're, when I was a kid in Indiana, and I, I, my mom says, "Hey, go mow the backyard," and I had a little snapper lawn mower with a bag on the back, and you 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 bag your grass, and you get it, the bag gets full, you dump it out by the curb. It's not feasible to bag a hundred, you know, seventy acres of turf. So you have every time you mow the golf course, those grass clippings just go down. They don't decompose to nothing. They build up what's called a thatch layer. And over time, that thatch layer gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And that's what they call a black layer under your fairway. And that's why your fairways, over time, start staying wetter and wetter for longer periods because rain and irrigation take longer to go through that. So we, when we do a renovation, we peel that off. Okay, so you've got natural sand back to the surface, which perks much faster. It helps your drainage component. You take all that off, and you literally dig a berry pit somewhere like under where you want a T elevated or you want to add to a berm, and you just bury it in those locations. Well, my, my last part of the question was, I thought you were bringing new dirt in. Hmm. But when you're co now coming in, where will you be coming in with equipment? For example, I look at the second hole, and some logistically, how are you going to, I'm just th thinking of the summer of 2023 with all these trucks on Winding Oaks Way and how they're going to enter and exit the course. They make really big helicopters these days. We fly, no, I'm, kidding. I'm joking with you. It's good. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'll be honest with you, I am not the contractor, so I can't technically answer that question, but they will obviously have to find an access point. Um, is it, I believe, between um, five and six, there's a street? They will probably come through a street access, through a cart, through a cart path access way. That's how they'll come in. And they'll service like, uh, five, five, four, when they go to five, you'll, you'll, do, you'll go five, you'll be able to access five, four, three, two from that, from that one location. Thank you. And he's saying you've got to access another location as well. So I, yeah. Thank you, everybody. We've got an, another big part of this presentation here today, and it's already quarter to six. If we could, you want to go ahead and ask uh, a quick just, this, this is going to be a quick question. Sure. My name is Jerry Vashon. I'm a walker. I walk playing a course. I, I have a cat power caddy that I use. And I was wondering if there's any consideration given to the um, going from the green uh, on eight to the uh, black tee, black ball tee on, on uh, nine, Go cutting right through because it's a straight shot. And I was wondering if you could 
and make a, you know, I, I don't like to hold anybody up. Yeah. And when you got to walk all the way around to the uh, three T's, and it makes a, a, you know, quite a while. So I'll be honest so. with you, I never looked at that. I was, well, you're the first one that mentioned that, so. Well, I'm sure any walker would appreciate it. I'll have to look at that. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, we're going to move to the uh, facilities part of this, and I wanted to introduce uh, somebody who really doesn't sleep at night and is nothing is too particular and too detailed for her to investigate, Gail Fisher, and she's going to take care of that. You didn't read any, I, unless uh -huh. I'm the only one who sent. You have one, Tom. Sorry, just let's find it. Well, we're trying to get our question in. Sure, thank you. What What was your question, sir? Um, could you just tell us yours? I, we've answered most of these questions in, in Kip's and comments, so that's uh, really covered it. And maybe we didn't get to you. My question had to do with two and three, the burns that were put up between the uh, Veterans Park and our homes were set there for a purpose to keep the noise pollution and the light pollution out of our homes, the back of our homes. Mm -hmm. Now you're reducing those and taking those trees out. And so we're it's diminishing the value and the pleasure of our homes. Okay, we are we are making modifications to the golf course to solve issues that were addressed through the master planning, particularly the focus group session, how to make improvements. The intention is not to devalue your homes. I will tell you, there's still a lot of trees in the golf park, a good dog park that are still there. And the intention is not to just because we're taking a berm down, it's not the fact we're we're not we're not gonna leave it bare and we're gonna replant it reestablish it by making more, we have to soften it a little bit to make space this way and then put, put the vegetation back on it. I referenced no different than say Hurricane Irma when it came through in 17. I know after, at that point in time, I think you lost most of that vegetation. It's since been replanted and grown back up. We will we'll be doing the same thing. It's grown up, it's, it has grown up and we have our uh, light and noise pollution down again. The Some of the uh, trees and bushes that are shown that are on are there originally that are no longer there now under your under your proposed plan is going to diminish the value of our homes and also the pleasure of the back of our homes and we've spent money to improve the back of our homes and it's going to be taken away no matter what you say on I'm, the, I'm not defending I'm not defending this Joyce I'm telling I'm, you why we did it Okay, I'm not, the, I'm, not, I'm not saying you're not wrong, but I'm saying side, I you know, the intention is not to devalue almost anything. Vertical. And the reason they're sloped over on the Stonebridge side is that they can hold those trees and bushes up. And if you cut those back, they're not going to hold those trees and bushes up. Well, to, to modify the burn, I, you I would don't want to argue with it. I'm making a point that you're diminishing the value of our homes, and those of us that live along two and three I don't believe appreciate it. We have we we wanted it after the hurricane, we let it grow back up, and trees were planted in there, and we like it the way it's growing and the way it's it's uh, given us the uh, security and the comfort of the back of our homes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I'll be quick. Tom, I'll be quick. Uh, I had three questions, but two of them are binary. I was in the restroom the other day on, uh, Can help you with I that guess, one. <laughs> 616, and I was wondering if you guys included an upgrade for the restrooms in this big project we have planned, because they can surely use an upgrade. All right, I'm not, surprised no one asked that question. <laughs> renovation. Uh, it is not. There's not, okay, so it should if be. If y'all are here that summer and you got nothing better to do, we'll give you a couple <laughs> cans of paint or something. <laughs> No, you got to see it to believe it. But anyway, my, my next binary question is, is there anything we can do about the, the grass that grows adjacent to the edge of the ponds? Uh, I go to other clubs, they do not have this grass. 
and we can find our balls should they drop that. in the water. Mark, do you want to speak to that? He doesn't know. <laughs> we will make the golf course pretty. <laughs> now, I, I understand your question about the aquatic plantings. We have a very extensive aquatic planting and littoral system here. When we do get into to modify the lake, some of our littoral shelves will be shifted around and our priority will be to minimize some of the um, aquatic plantings on the golf course side uh, for, the, for those who want to look for golf balls and hold up play, we can do that. Good. <laughs> Another comedian. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me just introduce Gail Fisher, who really is probably the hardest working and most detailed person I've ever met and does not sleep. But you're gonna know why once you see what she's got. Okay, <laughs> I'm a squink, what can I say? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's almost good evening, and I have to just inform you that unfortunately, I can't speak as fast as Kip, Kip can. So, thank you for bearing with me at this. The time has finally come. Just about one year ago today, on November 13th, the Club Facilities Improvement Subcommittee <laughs> held our first meeting. We started out with five members, what am I doing? Did I do that? No. They're controlling that? Uh, you got to go back to my first slide, please. Sorry about this. Okay. Which soon grew to be, quickly grew to be nine members, uh, which have provided invaluable input support. Could not have finished this project without them. And um, while we each knew at least one person on the committee, none of us knew all of, each, all of the members of the committee. So along the way towards building this great plan, we got made some good friends as well. We've had over 40 meetings, reviewed findings from the facility planning and other surveys. We made field trips to other clubs. We researched what current buyers are looking for. We talked to management and staff. We developed Q&A. We held poster sessions and we answered member emails and wrote Bridging the Future Communications. When building this plan, we didn't always agree at first, but after discussion, we came to consensus keeping you, our fellow members, and the club at the forefront of all of our decisions. And so for us today, today is a celebration, a celebration of what the future can hold for all of us. Before I get into the details, I'd like to acknowledge our partners in this collaborative effort. Uh, sitting in the front row here, David Porman, if you want to stand up for a second. Uh, David Porman, architect, is here. Uh, David is the mastermind of this incredible plan, taking advantage of our limited footprint and patiently accommodating our multiple tweaks and changes. So thank you for that, David. Um, Lisa Briggs of Club Design Group wanted to be here today. She planned to be here, but unfortunately, a sports injury, uh, one of rolling her ankle playing pickleball, fair warning, <laughs> over the weekend is keeping her at home. Nonetheless, we hope that you will agree that the results of Lisa and her team's efforts are breathtaking renderings um, of the facilities that can be ours to enjoy. I would also like to give a nod to Jeff, that Jeff Nunner, that Jim introduced earlier, um, to say that he will be the driver of the construction schedule and keep us on budget, which is very important to all of us. As we didn't have the benefit of having an owner's rep at the beginning of the last renovation, it was a lesson well learned for all of us. We believe that Jeff has the skills and experience to deliver on having the club fully open by December 1st. 
Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. So we started with the Stonebridge vision, and then we went to set our goal, which was to create a plan that will significantly enhance the member experience of all members, whether you live here full-time or part-time. And we didn't want to just create a plan. We wanted to create an extraordinary plan that would add value to Stonebridge and to all our properties. Our efforts were driven by guiding principles which we applied throughout. And in short, we wanted to deliver something for everyone and value for all. Our project, Bridging the Future, delivers on member input oops, sorry, and the key priorities um, that are listed here. The, the the top priority was to expand the bistro, to make dining a year-round experience in a sports bar atmosphere. Of course, you just heard about the golf course renovation. We want to enhance the grill room bar area by making it a more indoor-outdoor social environment. And we wanted to have a place to increase the space for activities that ended with the creation of the community center. We didn't start out to build a community center. This, the community center evolved from discussions with David, from management, discussions with management, and additional members who, who participate in a lot of the activities in here and often come and find there's not a meeting space or there's not a very uh, convenient meeting space to meet. So we couldn't build on top of our current fitness center. Uh, the engineer said the structure wouldn't support it. We had an opinion from a local general contractor who told us that it would cost more and be more risky to build on top of the current uh, fitness center than just to tear it down and start over again. So we also looked at building behind the bistro, and, but limited views and shade, a lot of, too much shade made us reconsider. So David helped us determined that if we could push the community center to the north of where the fitness center is now and straighten it out, that we could gain the additional square footage we need to make this happen. You may recognize this view from the photo on the cover of the Members Voter Guide. It gives us an appreciation uh, for all the space that we're going to gain by filling in that bulkhead and pushing the community center north. So how did we do it? We gained the 10,000 additional square feet by filling in the bulkhead, as Kip referred to, and then and using some of that space that we obtained by moving, moving the community center north. So you can see in a side-by-side -side with our current footprint just how much more spacious, you can have an appreciation for the spaciousness of this building and the integration of all the facilities in a pretty, in, in a complex, like a center complex uh, cornered by, by the community center at the top and then the, the bistro at the bottom. And while I'm on here, I'd like to point out that we've had questions about where's the fencing gonna be positioned. And you can consider the community center and the bistro to be borders. So when you enter from the east parking lot, there'll be a gate at the front of the walkway. Alongside the Boche courts will be a, a six foot wall is gonna be built to separate that space from the delivery area. Alongside the tennis side, there'll be, you see there's, there'll be landscaping with fencing placed within the landscaping and one or two gates over there for access into the complex. The lake of course will be a border and then where the current takeout window is in the bistro now, that takeout window will remain. And just right of it, or to the east of it, we will drop another fencing in landscaping um, with a gate, one or two gates, so that you can enter from the golf course site as well. So here is a, here is a rendering uh, showing, incorporating the beautiful stacked stone wall that, that Kip talked about and landscaping along that hole. I should point out that you may see that the, the new buildings are done in the same colors that adorn the gatehouses. And at that point in time, the clubhouse is also scheduled to be repainted. So it will also be painted in complementary colors, but they're coastal colors. And, and when you, what the 
the furniture you see in the renderings and in the decor is just neutral representations of the design work that's yet to come because we haven't picked out any fabrics, any, any, any detailed decisions have been made on interior design. So you can enter the bistro from the walkway in the east parking lot with Foche on your right, the community center pool and spa to your left. You will enter a late, you can come into the bistro in late afternoon and come into the bistro, which will have an amazing view of the golf course. You can even, if you choose, enter the bistro from the clubhouse side. Once inside, you have a view towards the lake, or you can look back towards the community center and pool, or you can, and you can watch sports on TV from any seat in the house. And then again, you may just want to sit outside with a view towards the lake, or golf, or beautiful Ashton Oaks, <laughs> where I live. Okay, so here's a close-up of the bistro and the bistro kitchen layout, and you can see there's going to be plenty of seating. We heard from members that they, one of the wishes they had was they wanted additional outdoor seating. So you will have plenty of seating inside and outside. Uh, there, will be fire, there will be fire pits out in the front as well. There is additional space. Um, we're in the yellow portion in the back for uh, storage and an office downstairs. The new kitchen can then, in the yellow, will be designed for more efficient and timely meal service. And it will allow us, because we will be able to have refrigerators in there and we will be able to do the swap out for the different meals so that we can have dinner, dinner options as well as lunch options. So we'll have that flexibility with the, with the menu. There will be new restrooms added at the back in the light orange and um, with easy access to the bistro and to the voce courts. And in response to member feedback, you can really see from, uh, from the spring when we showed this, we had a central bar. But people, were, people said, we need a way to access the bistro if I'm at the pool or I'm playing boche without having to come inside the bistro to get a drink or to pick up some food. So we've reconfigured this at the end of the bar. There will be glass windows that open up. There'll be four bar chairs outside and there will be a service bar and a door where you can either come in and pick up food at the window or through the door. Next we come to the community center and pool. This multi-purpose building is more than just a fitness center. The first floor is primarily devoted to flexible meeting space. The card room will have enough tables in there for competitive card play. That room also divides so that it can be split into two to support more than one activity going on at a time. There'll be a yoga, meditation, multi-purpose space, which can also be used for meetings a tennis office, some storage, there'll be a massage and uh, physical therapy. Um, at this, we've heard from other clubs that their massage or physical therapy rooms are booked constantly. Uh, some clubs have a vendor that provides those services. Other clubs allow members to bring their own physical therapist or masseuse in, but that will, those details can be worked out later. Oh, I should go, go, I uh, can't go back. But I'll, I'll say a point about the parking right now. Um, when David did the plan for us and reconfigured the parking outside, additional handicapped parking is going to be available in front of the community center. Uh, that plan really showed one additional space. We're currently working out to see if there's other options and way we can configure the lot to pick up additional parking. So the second floor of the community center is really dedicated to fitness with a large aerobics room, which can double as a multi-purpose room for stretching, classes, and as you know, we have a terrace, we have a covered terrace outside which will have doors that open out, and you can host social events up there. You can set up a buffet table upstairs and you spill out to the 
to the terrace to watch tennis or other activities. The one thing I want to just point out about the square footage of the new building compared to the current building is that the fitness, the net area of fitness will be increased by about a third. And it will be about twice, a little more than twice the size of the, of the current fitness center, but you will have so much more going on there. Now I just want to remind everybody of the spectacular view that you will have if you're up on that second floor terrace of the fitness center, or the community center, sorry. And you can have that view whether you're watching tennis, reading a book, sitting with friends, or sweating on the cardio equipment. So when, once again, we go to the Bistro Community Center complex, and you can enter, you see the walkway up there, you can enter the pool on the northwest side of the pool through the, through the zero entry to the pool, which is also accessible for wheelchairs so that if, if someone needs to come into the pool that way, it's accessible for them. There'll be a spa shaped in the same way as the pool, a sun shelf, and then cabanas. Okay, so layout of the new pool and spa. The new pool, and I know this is a, a tipped over, a, a rotated image of it, um, but the pool is 48 feet at its widest and 75 feet at its longest. It's, 20, it's a 25 yard length. It's not an Olympic length pool. Someone had a question about that, so it's not, it's not an Olympic length pool. If you look, let me take this for a second. If you look at this part of the pool, it's over each 10 feet, it drops one foot. So it's a very gradual decline till you get over to this side, this edge of the pool and it's three and a half feet. So if you start here at three and a half feet, it gradually declines over the 75 feet to five foot depth. So current demand for aerobics exceeds the, exceeds the amount of participants that our current pool can hold. So this new pool should be able to hold twice, at least twice the number of members who want to come and join the water aerobics class. The other thing I'd like to say is that this, this is not a lap pool. It's a pool where if you want to swim or lap or two, you can jump in and do that too. Um, the three and a half foot depth allows people to do flip turns unless you're super tall and then you won't be able to, you may not be able to do them, but you will be able to flip turn in three and a half feet of water. The new spa is, is configured for comfortable seating. Um, we've had some questions. I don't have fancy drawings like this of the current pool and spa but this pool is about twice the square feet of the current pool, and the spa is about twice the square footage of the current spa. So speaking of seating, Just how many seats will we have? Well, the inside of the bistro will hold 115 people. There will be room for 31 seats at the bar and 84 seats at tables, making it possible for the, for the bistro to be a year-round dining destination at Stonebridge. There will be 116 seats outside, under cover, or at tables with umbrellas. And there will be 76 seats in the pool area comprised of chases, chases and soft seating. And the community center will have 21 four-top tables for cards. So now here's a close-up of that earlier shot I showed with the beautiful stacked stone and, and the landscaping that Mark is going to provide for us. This can be ours with a yes vote. 
following a yes vote, we've talked a little bit about the timetable already, but uh, we hope to start, I'm not gonna go through every detail of here, but we hope to start the demolition of the pool and the fitness center in the February, March timeframe of 2023, ahead of the storm season and ahead of other clubs that may be trying to do um, starting loan, uh, starting clubhouse renovations at the same time so that we can get a head start and a jump on that. And also ahead of the summer construction season. The golf course will close in mid-April. I think we talked about April 15th. And the bistro will close on May 1st. The dining and grill room will be open throughout the summer and fall. There will be normal tennis operations during this time. Arrangements will be made for reciprocal golf and fitness. Some fitness equipment will, is planned to be moved into the live oak room, so not all fitness during that time will have to be done, in, have to be done off campus. We plan to have the club fully open by December 1st in time for another great Stonebridge season. And so, imagine finding yourself at sunset walking up the 18th fairway or coming in from the walkway to enjoy dinner at the bistro. What a view. In <laughs> Thank you. Oh, kill myself. In closing, we recognize that everyone has their own thoughts and opinions, and each member household has one vote. I can assure you we're not making empty promises that we're not going to keep. What we hope you have seen today is the result of the honest efforts of dozens of your neighbors and friends who have worked tirelessly on all of our behalves. This renovation plan will increase member satisfaction and keep us competitive for years to come. We want Stonebridge to be the best it can be going forward, and we want to leave it better for those that follow, including some of our children and grandchildren. We hope you agree. All this, <laughs> all this for less than $12 per week more than what you are paying for the current renovation. So yes, we ask you to join us and bridge the future at Stonebridge together. And now, come fly with me through the new club facilities. Thank you.
Okay. Now we'll... Okay. Okay, so now we'll open it up for questions. Okay. I wrote a little page called The Paradise Experience, and, and that's sort of what we want to have here at Stonebridge. One of the, there's two things that, uh, that are not really uh, taken care of here. One is the, the, the card rooms, the meeting rooms, other places, and that has not been taken care of. We have this a little teeny thing right now. And, and some people want to play c more cards and stuff like that than we have the, the, the definitive uh, capability to do. Uh, more importantly, uh, those pictures you show are very beautiful and everything, but everybody's going to get skin cancer because of the sun coming down. So the, the proper sh shielding, which we do not have on these balconies, which we could spread it out more, the sun strips along and hits everybody here, sometimes making it unusable. And every place should be usable except for, you know, right in the pool. You, outside the pool, these umbrellas we have or unless you really stack them correctly like they do in some places, they are not adequate to provide the sunscreen for people to stay out there. So those are two th things that I bring up that are very, very important. And that means maybe more vegetation and, and more of a uh, Caribbean or Hawaiian sort of setting where there's more more shade and people in that pool out there you see the people out there just frying out there and we we can't we shouldn't do that we should have protected them from the sun okay thank you take that my name is sandy katz two questions in one of the slides you had it said that there would be no lunch service from June to mid-October in the grill room upstairs. So that means there will be no lunch service on campus, period, for that period of time. Is that true? I'll have Tim, an Tim answer that. Sure, uh, correct. The, the plan during the renovation, um, during the slow, slower months, when the golf course is closed now, when we have the airifications on the golf course three times during the summer, we do not provide lunch service during those times because most of our lunch business is driven, most if not all, is driven by golfers. Uh, so that's correct. What we plan on doing though is opening up for an additional night of dinner. So instead of three nights of dining during the uh, summer months, opening up for four plus having some special events. And one other question, with the seating that you showed there, we will be doubling the seating, so you'll have about 200 downstairs and another 200 up here. What is the plan to utilize this space up here? It's the same as it is now. So on a Friday <laughs> night in season, we do 200 to 240 at the bistro. And up here in the dining room, we do 200 now. So we'll just be better able to accommodate the members that want to come to the club on a Friday night. And every other night of the week, you know, we have activities going on, whether it's, you know, a buffet night, a wine dinner, bingo, trivia, there's always something going on up here as well. I have, I have a question, John Burnham, again. I have a question relative to the survey that was done. Summary of the 2020 facility planning study, where there's a whole bunch of numbers and percentages and so on. For recap of those who didn't know it, there were 1,520 surveys sent out. 840 were returned. Now, that is not the membership that's two votes per 
household if its title was held husband and wife or whatever it might be. So you only had a 55% return of those surveys, 45% not returned. All the percentages that you recite in here basically are based on the 55%. There are several items that have come up that were totally ignored by the committee and or whoever made the decision of what to propose. Because as an example, uh, the respondents voted opposed to the bocce courts, 42% to 31%, not counting then the missing 20 some odd percent of the returned surveys. There was a no. Redesigning the pool to include lap lanes, 50% of those returned, no change, please. They didn't want a change in the existing swimming pool. Uh, the issue of dedicated space, 38% said yes, 27% no, missing 35%. Uh, let's see, one other thing, the bocce courts, like I said, was, I believe, no to that 42 to 31. Uh, oh, physical therapy and massage rooms. 45% of the people said no, 28% said yes. However, none of these things were taken into account apparently because they're all designated in your new program. Well, you John, let me just say this. One, 55% response or 840 members by our consultant said that that's an excellent response and it meant that the data we could have confidence in the data to within plus or minus two or two two point three percentage points so every person in this club had an opportunity to respond to the survey so we were able with that sample size to get statistical differences between what people said now while that formed the basis of what we did, that wasn't the only input we took. We talked to management and staff. We went to other clubs to see what they were doing. We looked at what new members are looking for and, at the, and we had to build a new pool because optimizing the location of the bistro required that we build a new pool because of the shading and the light and the spacing. No, it didn't. The, the question became originally with regard to the wall that was going to be built, that's where the bistro was originally mentioned to go. The, pro, the diagrams that were submitted for review in 2017 showed three layouts. The closest layout that we have is the one that was chosen then, nothing was done on it, but it was done in 2017. And now we're, we're talking about gaining 5,000 square feet of land. You're gaining it by tearing down a building comprised of 3,500 square feet. And you're increasing it to 4,000 square feet per floor for 8,000 square feet. So now you're not only doubling it, you're almost tripling the space for the community building because of card players. So one group has said no. The committee said, forget that. We have a better idea. So. Everyone has, will have an opportunity to vote up or down, depending on whether they are resistant to this kind of change and or whether they have financial interests or whether they just don't like it. But we had to look at all factors, not just the member input. And if you're going to build a new pool, we didn't, when, when the, the three designs went away after we, we put aside that project and we started over and we had the opportunity to build something better than what was in those plans earlier. Hi, Gail. My name is Phil Payne. I'm a former board member. I've uh, lived here in Stonebridge for a little over 21 years. 
and uh, I admire the work that the board has done on this whole process, but I have some concerns. You talk to us about the costs, and who would buy anything without knowing what the final cost would be? And we don't have those final costs. We have estimated costs, and those can change considerably. And then if they do run over the 13 million that we've been talking about, it will be valued in, value engineered, which means things will be taken out. I'm not quite convinced that we'll have a say-so in what those may or may not be. Can you answer that for me, please? Okay, just to repeat, uh, um, the board has committed to $13 million, $124 per member per month, and for a 12-year term. Uh, we will look at that on an ongoing basis, and if we have situations where we need to change things, depending upon how small they are, how large they are, how much they cost, um, we will come back to the membership if things go really badly and we have to do something. But as of this point, Phil, uh, it's $13 million, 124 a month, and a uh, 12-year loan. I guess I'm bothered by the fact that all we have are estimated costs. You don't have any solid costs yet. You have a ceiling, not to exceed those three numbers. Okay, that's, that's interesting. I guess I'd like to be your used car salesman. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Gail Howie, yeah, and my husband Bill and I have been here for 15 years. I'm also a former board member. I know how hard the board and all these committees works. Um, I might not be here in, I don't know, 14, 15 years. Who knows? Maybe we'll move along. We were the young ones in the beginning, and now we're the older ones. Easy, Gail, easy. Yeah. <laughs> but um, these board members are all from different communities here in Stonebridge. And with this, the hard work that they put in, I think that um, Bill and I support this plan renovation and have complete trust and support in the board and the committees for what they're doing. Because I think, and I think maybe a lot of other people think, if you aren't moving forward, you're going backwards. And so I hope that we see Stonebridge moving forward. Thank you. Andrea Kent, I'm from Middleburg, and I have a question about uh, when all this facility closes down, what in the last renovation that we did with the clubhouse, we laid off people, all the um, waiters and things, and we paid their insurance. We paid a lot of their benefits, expecting them to all come back. And one came back after taking care of them all that time. Our chef came back. He stayed for what was it, three days or three weeks? I can't remember after we paid him full salary and all his benefits. What's the plan for our workers here? Are we going to lay people off and, and that's it? Hire all new people or are we just going to keep them around and pay all the benefits and the insurance for them? Well, the good news is that the food and beverage program will be, will be open through the whole summer. So we don't have to lay off the staff like we did last time. Last time we lost all F&B other than a beverage card. So this time around, we'll be able to keep our full-time year-round employees employed through the summer months, and we'll still have the seasonal team that we bring back each year as well. So the advantage this time around is we don't have to have that concern of rehiring, which was, for those that were here, that was a very big challenge after the last renovation. So that won't happen this time. But obviously, I don't think with everything being un constru under construction, we're going to need as many people here full time working as we have in a regular summer or in those months. My second thing is, as most of you know, I am not for this. And I still believe that a great deal of the angst that is in this community right now would have never happened if you had just given us options, which you would not do. Thank you. Uh, Rich Napoli from uh, Braeburn. I've been here 21 years. Uh, 
I just want to know why the rec center is on the second floor and not on the first floor. I mean, we got a lot of senior citizens. We got handy pe handicapped people here. Why can't it be moved to the first floor? Uh, the fitness is on the second floor. Um, for what reason? Because we needed more space. You, you needed more card rooms we and, need, and no, massage we, rooms on the first floor? There's less space on the first floor because because we have an office down there. I mean, the way that that is. Oh, so the office is more important than people going to the gym every no, but day. The card so room the, down so there our employees does not don't have to walk up steps. First of all, uh, there is an elevator. So well, how many how many people? Can we get three people in there? Four people? Ten people? At least. <laughs> you can actually put a, a hospital stretcher in there and a gurney. So if someone is sick upstairs, you can just take them down the elevator. All right. And it would be quite so, the view so, when you're so you, walking on the you're not uh, even treadmill. Consider, you're not going to consider moving it to the first floor where it's, it gets mm -hmm. more use? Uh, no, there's no guarantee that you move it from one floor to the other that's going to get more use. No, it People does. Are the, gym, the gym gets more, more, more use than card games and, and massage powers. It doesn't, it doesn't get used. We, we got at least probably 50, 100 people sometimes a day going, to the, going over there in season. Well, the, the, the other thing we gain by having the card room on the first floor is flexible space. A fitness room, you're not moving a treadmill if you're having a party. But on the first floor, we can easily move those tables out. There's an, there are sliding glass doors that will open up onto the pool deck. I'm sure you all have been to many neighborhood parties at the pool. We'll be able to facilitate those much better by having the card room on the first floor. You could do the same thing on the second floor, too. Well, it'd be hard to get on the pool deck from the second floor, but you'd have a nice view for yeah, sure. Yeah, but you have a nice view up there, right? Definitely, and you'll have it when you're on the treadmill. Yeah. Uh, John Zetsman, and I've lived here a while. Uh, no one's mentioned, and I'm surprised, we adding additional facilities, more room and everything. No one's mentioning the parking, which is a disaster right now. What are we going to do with all this additional use and people that are coming to the club? Where are they going to park? I, I spoke about the parking earlier and said that right now there will be additional handicap parking out in front of the um, community center. But right now we have net one parking space on that side. We had a plan earlier several years ago that incorporated more spaces. So we have the engineer looking at how we can get more spaces out there. And I, I you know, people don't all use the club at every, at the same times of the day. So there isn't, 800 members aren't going to be driving their car up here to, to at the same time of the day. So we're just going to have to look at ways that we can address the parking and we're not we're not at that point yet other than we know we can get an additional space from the from the original design that David laid out but we have some other options one parking spot's not going to do it and what we're proposing and Wanda you want us to approve is additional space for uh, dining outside dining here swimming pool recreation those are all going to take additional space parking spots. Not everybody will come at the same time, but more people will come than are coming right now. I hope so, and if they don't, we're wasting our money. And we're looking, we're looking for ways to address it. I will say, um, are you talking about more space up here because we are not creating any more space in the dining room, grill room? No. I'd like to make a statement. Uh, I first would like to offer my apologies to Larry and Joyce Linder. I think it was terrible the way they were treated by the crowd, and I'd like to say to my feelings to the board, I think it was poorly handled that any member should feel free to come up and speak his piece and not be intimidated. Thank you. Thank you. 
hi, uh, my name is Pam Ford. Um, I live uh, in Hawthorne Estates, and I've been here for about five years, just over five years. Um, uh, despite, never mind six, I've over five years. Um, basically, um, I am delighted to see improvements to the club. I would like to maintain my property value. Um, however, I am wondering, uh, uh, are there any chances at all to have any changes made, particularly to the area of the swimming pool. Um, I don't know how many people here would, would want to put their lounger in the water and uh, rather than have a more, um, let's say, formal, rectangular, whatever, swimming pool that would accommodate people. I was told that it's a shallow entrance to walk, be able to walk into the pool or a wheelchair into the pool, which I fully agree with, although other clubs do have lifts around their swimming pool to help those people who can't enter the pool. I just find it a complete personal, and everyone's having a personal opinion, a complete waste of space to have a shelf with the glorious idea of we can put four sunbeds and you can sunbathe in the water. I personally would like to know, are there any changes possible? I will vote. I do support the board. Um, but there are some areas, and I agree with the gentleman, to have an elevator and people who are rehabilitating get into an elevator, which can break down, uh, and go up to the second floor for the gym seems absolutely ludicrous. But I'm just wondering, Will there be any more calm feedback? I'm in support of the whole project for minuscule or changes to be heard calmly. Thank you. One of the, um, you ha we have restrictions on how big the pool can be. So if we remove that small shelf, it, it, it's possible, but I don't know how much additional space that would get us inside the swimming pool. I mean, for the zero entry, we want to make sure that people can have a way into the pool. They can either go down the stairs or go in the zero entry. So we're making it so that we don't have to have a lift and maintain it and the costs of maintaining a lift. So that's the reason to have the zero entry, um, the zero entry pool, um, many places have gone to that as a way to get into swimming pools. Any other comments, questions? Okay, I think. I'm, I'm Rob Ford. Um, I don't know what the process is for winding this up. People are coming and going. There's a glee club coming out there. Um, so I wonder whether or not you could sum up, Jim, because uh, on behalf of the audience, I'd like to acknowledge the great job. I, I think we're being uh, somewhat disingenuous to Jeff, uh, to, to Jeff's on the front, listening to all of us bitching away here. You've done a great job. You've got my vote. Let's go for it. And can we go to the bar? So moved. Don't forget to vote. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's just what I thought. Thank you very much. Hey, Bobby. 